I, mean, uh, I will call this hearing of the Judiciary, Finance and Civil Law Committee to order. Uh, today is March 21st, 2023. We do have a quorum present and I need the audience to be quiet or we cannot do our work. Thank you. Um, first order business will be moving the minutes. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the minutes of March 16th, 2023? So moved. Uh, Representative Niska moves the minutes of March 16th, 2023. Uh, any discussion to the minutes? Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The minutes are approved. Uh, we are going to do uh, Representative Kozlowski's bill first. Uh, I will move uh, House File 1873 uh, to be re-referred back to the Environment, Natural Resources, Finance, and Policy Committee. Representative Kozlowski, welcome to the committee. Uh, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Chair Becker Finn and members of the committee. I'm here with uh, House File 1873, which is the DNR Enhanced Enforcement Authority. Um, compliance with the state's water laws and DNR permits is necessary to protect and ensure the best use of Minnesota water resources. And DNR permits use the best available information to provide for equity and fairness among water users and project proponents. Uh, so to provide for the protection of water quantity, quality, and ecological benefits, Non-compliance with water laws or permit conditions also threatens the sustainability of water resources that Minnesotans depend on. So DNR's existing enforcement authorities are really insufficient to address such serious and repeated violations to our state's water laws. And changes to the existing authorities would really help DNR ensure our water supply is sustainable, protect public water resources, and to address uh, non-compliance using a variety of compliance tools. So the intent of this proposed policy before you is to ensure that DNR has every tool necessary to protect Minnesota's water resources for future generations and I would have with me here Katie Smith with Minnesota DNR to testify and share more and walk through this bill. All right, uh, welcome to the committee and just reminding folks the reason this is in front of our committee is because of the penalties portion of the bill. So uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, Madam Chair, committee members, Katie Smith, Director of the Ecological and Water Resources Division at Minnesota Department of Natural Resources. Thanks for the opportunity to be here today. Um, the language contained in this bill is very similar to statutes governing the MPCA's tools and authorities. The DNR has existing authority to issue administrative penalty orders for water appropriation. The proposal would give DNR greater discretion for calculating penalties, increase the APO cap to $40,000, and require penalties to be paid for violations that are serious or repeat. Now, the APO is a valuable tool, but it can only be used in certain types of situations. Other compliance tools would give DNR new authority to utilize actions to compel performance, one being a stipulation agreement, a negotiated settlement agreement that is not limited by a maximum penalty amount, nor a corrective action time frame, and provides for a negotiated settlement with the violator. For the most serious violations, such as those that may harm or have harmed natural resources, repeated violations, or where economic benefit is gained, the DNR is seeking authority to assess civil penalties of up to $10,000 per day of violation. The language allows for the penalty amount to be determined by the court. Civil penalties and damages provided for in that subdivision may be recovered by a civil action brought by the Attorney General in the name of the state in Ramsey County District Court. Civil penalties and damages provided for in the subdivision may also be resolved by the commissioner through a negotiated stipulation agreement between the DNR and a party. It is anticipated that the stipulation agreement would be the process and tool to assess and recover penalties under this chapter. The chapter tools and permits issued under this chapter may be enforced through several ways. The bill allows for willful or negligent violations of these water programs to be referred by DNR to law enforcement agencies for investigation. A violation of this chapter, order, or agreements and permits issued under this chapter constitutes a public nuisance and may be enjoined in an action in the name of the state brought by the Attorney General. In an action to compel performance of an order issued by the Commissioner, the court may require a defendant to perform any and all acts within the defendant's power that are reasonably necessary to accomplish the purposes of the order. The DNR would not seek court assistance unless the party does not respond to the order and all other options have been exhausted. If the municipality is a defendant, the court may require the municipality to exercise its powers in order to pay a penalty or perform corrective actions, but leaves that local unit of government the discretion regarding how it will obtain funds to comply with the court's order. An action brought under the subdivision would be venued in Ramsey County District Court. 
The DNR feels these enhancements of authorities and tools would help ensure our water resources are protected and available for future generations of Minnesotans. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. All right, thank you for your testimony. We do have a couple folks signed up. I have Anna Brigier and then Doug Carnival on deck. Please introduce yourself and proceed. Madam Chair, Brock, if I could begin. Uh, sure. I just we've <laughs> we've got a lot of bills to process, so. Thank you, Madam Chair. <laughs> Carnival McGranchick, Carnival Law Firm, representing the Irrigators Association of Minnesota, along with Anna Regi. Um, the reason we're here is because, <clears throat> in our opinion, this bill is is overly broad. Um, I understand the concern that was raised by the DNR was for an event that occurred by a non-permitted uh, organization, didn't have a water permit, and breached the aquifer. And as a result, a significant environmental event occurred. However, the drafting of this bill is a solution that does not only deal with that major circumstance, but affects every permit holder of water, including a small family farmer like, like Anna. Uh, as a result, the bill is, is, we think, needs a substantial amount of work. Specifically, I might just talk about the two areas that are of concern. First, the bill changes the fine provisions for an use of water above appropriation from a maximum of $20,000 to a maximum of $40,000 and eliminates the incremental uh, provisions that said for $1,000 for a minor violation, that would be the maximum fine, or $10,000 for a moderate violation, or $20,000 for a significant violation or severe violation. Those are eliminated from the first version of the bill to the engrossed version of the bill. That's, that's an important distinction, and it doesn't matter whether you had one gallon over your permit or a thousand gallons or a million gallons over your permit. The second and probably the most important part of this bill, and I'll be brief, is it imposes potential criminal liability on family farmers like Anna and her colleagues, um, and there is no exception for them, no matter what the appropriation is above their limits, um, and it doesn't provide for an exemption or some sort of defense if they use more than their appropriation for the only reason they would do that, which is because there's a drought. Uh, if there's a drought- Okay, I'll, ha I'll have to ask you to, to wrap up. I'm guessing you want to give her some time to testify. We're working with DNR to try and uh, to correct some of these concerns with the bill, but it's a significant problem and I don't think it's ready for, for prime time. Yep, and just so everybody in the room knows, everyone was told when they signed up that they get 90 seconds, so hopefully you have prepped your 90 seconds and that's, that's what we're gonna stick to. Uh, please uh, introduce yourself and proceed. Welcome to the committee. Hi, my name is Anna Brazy, and I operate a family, my family farm in Rice, Minnesota. We're a fourth generation family farm and we prioritize um, sustainable regenerative agriculture and conservation of natural resources. Um, we're also a certified egg water quality uh, producer. We grow food like potatoes, kidney beans, and, and corn. Um, like Doug said, uh, the real challenge with this bill is it doesn't take into effect that most of the time farmers, 96% of the time farmers are trying to do the right thing. They're trying to um, grow their crops for the state of Minnesota within the parameters that they've set. And, um, and uh, you know, in the case of a drought or other times, I mean, really the case of a drought is the only time when uh, water users go over. On my farm in 2021, um, of, of my pivots, I had a couple of pivots that went over and I reported my overage. And I, I think this is gonna be very difficult to, uh, because farmers self-report their water use, I think this is gonna be really difficult to enforce in farmers. And in conversations with the DNR, I don't think their intention is to criminalize us or, or issue APOs to farmers. And so I think there just needs to be some exemption for, for drought years or for agriculture. Thank you, Madam Chair, appreciate your time. Yep, and, and just to remind members who this is going back to the Environment Committee so it can be further discussed there as well. Uh, are there any other members of the public wishing to testify on this bill? All right, not seeing any, we'll move on to member discussion. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, Representative Kozlowski, um, I'm just curious on um, on the um, uh, the 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 venue for any of these cases that would go to court. Why do they have to go to Ramsey County? There's irrigation all over this state. Some of it's 
that some of these farmers in particular are four or five hours away. So why do they have to come to Ramsey County to have their, their case heard? Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, uh, Re Chair Beckerfin, and to Representative Scott for the question. Um, I do know that uh, we had that question in the last committee, and we'll turn that over to my testifier to answer. Uh, go ahead. Um, Chair, um, Representative Scott, uh, my understanding is uh, the reason it's venued in Ramsey Court, at Ramsey County Court, is because um, the, the Capitol and state offices are located there, and that's the reason behind that. Representative Scott. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, normally, if there's... Um, it, the venue is the sort of the scene of the crime, right? That's where the hearings and everything take place. So I'm wondering, is that something that you might be willing to change to um, just re eliminate that because law would then naturally f flow to wherever the, the suspected or the, um, uh, the, the penalty or the, the penalty causing event took place? Uh, Director Smith? Uh, Madam Chair, Representative Scott, um, yeah, I, I would have to go back to um, our general counsel at DNR and potentially the Attorney General's office and, and get their opinion on that, but I'm certainly willing to have that conversation. Thank you. Thank, um, and Madam Chair, thank Representative you. Representative Scott. Thank you. Um, and are you, um, are you feel like you're working well together with the farmers? I mean, some of the, um, the testimony this morning was pretty compelling in my, in my estimation. Um, and I mean, the penalties are exorbitant in this now, um, especially for farmers during a drought. And um, if we want to eat, we got to let the farmers do their thing, right? So is that something that you're still in communication with, um, with the farmers and Mr. Carnival, who's representing the irrigation folks? Uh, Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Chair Beckerfin and, and uh, Representative Scott for the question, yes. And um, continuing conversations with the irrigators as well as with the uh, Minnesota counties as well. Um, and I do believe that we can uh, get to language that works for everybody. Um, that's actually one of the really important pieces of this is, as was described, the 96%, the what we're really trying to get at is to give the DNR more tools um, to work on prevention, on education, and bring folks into compliance um, with a broader spectrum including non, um, you know, fine, non-monetary up to the most egregious where we're really trying to get is that 4% of non-permit holders as well as permit holders who are overdrawing. An example is in northwestern Minnesota during the last drought where there was a city, uh, the city of Warren, I believe, where actually a large corporate irrigator, a potato farmer had overdrawn by billions of gallons and actually was bringing not only the water supply, but also when you overdrown the water supply, it then can potentially contaminate the soil, which leads to a public health crisis for um, all users in all communities. And so that's the, the balance and being able to make sure that the DNR has the right tools to be able to match the, the problem at hand. Um, so yes, we will continue conversations to, to your question with to make sure that both irrigators and farmers have what they need that we're not penalizing or targeting groups that um, are, are not the ones who are the egregious users, but also working to bring into compliance um, for folks who are overdrawing. Uh, Representative Scott, and then we've got a couple of your other uh, members. Thank you, Madam questions. Chair. Um, final question is, um, why the change in the structure of the penalties? Um, it used to be more um, uh, sort of a step up. Um, if you, you know, you get the warning, you know, the penalties are rapidly um, increasing and more blanket approach than an incremental approach. Why the change? Representative Kozlowski. Thank you, Chair Beckerfin and Representative. Um, I think that's a great question um, and answer for my testifier to be able to describe that um, difference. Sure. Director uh, Smith. Madam Chair, Representative Scott, um, DNR still retains the discretion to calculate the penalty based on the merits of each particular case. So um, we would develop program guidance to look at the type of violation that occurs. And as Representative Kozlowski mentioned, we have tools that we could use for you know, minor violations up to major violations. So if it was a serious or repeated violation, that's when a penalty would be considered to be non-forgivable. And we would look at you know, how many violations, what the severity was, et cetera, when determining how much the penalty should be. And again, this mirrors um, MPCA's uh, statutory authority. So it would give DNR greater discretion for 
um, the utilization of the penalty calculation. Representative Johnson. Chair Becker Finn, uh, Representative Kozlowski. <laughs> yeah, I'm just trying to figure out the words I'm doing. The Representative Scott took some of my questions. Again, part of the issue that I see with this bill, it's a sledgehammer instead of a scalpel dealing with a single incident uh, affecting many people, including a lot of farmers. And our ag industry is about <clears throat> is a meat, it's, it's how we feed our families. Uh, food is not uh, manufactured in, a, in the grocery store, it's grown by our farmers. And this is going to be a huge impact on the agricultural industry across the state. I was just looking up, we have a lot of irrigation system up in the Hallock area. And there's an incident that happens up there. Uh, the way the bill is written, uh, basically the commissioner shall issue a fine. There's no option. And on line 4.26, uh, penalties and enforcement, and it says a person issued a, a notice forfeits and must pay the state a penalty in the amount determined by the, by the district court of not more than $10,000 per day. Now that farmer in Halleck, he's got uh, only a couple options to defend. If he wants to appeal and drive all the way down to St. Paul without going through a different state to get down here, it's six and a half hour drive one way for court. Now the offense occurred not in Ramsey County, but in the northwest corner of the state. But they have to drive to St. Paul in Ramsey County to go to court. It's generally been the th issue where the uh, court is held in the jurisdiction where it occurs. Now that farmer's got only five choices to choose from to defend himself. An act of God, an act of war, negligence on the part of the state, an act failure to act that constitutes sabotage or vandalism, or any combination thereof. It doesn't talk about equipment malfunction, which is not an act of God. But there's little choices for a farmer to, def a farmer to defend themselves. So this bill needs a lot of work. It actually needs to go to the Ag, Ag Committee to deal with some of these issues because this is going to affect the, our ag industry dramatically. And it's not, it's, the motion wasn't going to go, have it go there. Uh, Chair becker I think this, how this impacts farmers so dramatically, I think it does need to go to the Ag Committee to get them taken care of. Um, and bef before we send this bill out, I will be making that motion to send it to the Ag Committee because it, I think it's important for the agricultural community well, to deal with this. Representative Johnson, the motion before us is to send it to the Environment Committee, so we would vote on that first. So, I do hope that you do talk to the ag industry um, because this, what, this is going to be just devastating to them. Um, it'll be devastating to our food resources. You know, agriculture is about 20% of our state economy. You wipe that out, and we're in real trouble. Ag the egg industry has been dealing with a lot already, and they're, um, they're doing everything they can to keep their costs down, <clears throat> food production up, but without irrigation, especially during a drought year, we will not have food, and our prices of our food in our grocery stores are going to skyrocket. Um, one thing this committee has done, and 
I've learned in this committee in the uh, eight years I've been on it is you always have to look for the unintended consequences of a bill. Uh, bec because sometimes the unintended consequences are worse than what we are trying to fix. So please consider getting it to the Ag Committee. I think it's important. They need to be heard. All right. Uh, Representative Weens. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Kozlowski and uh, Ms. Smith. Um, I applaud you for taking on this really big issue. Um, our natural resources, again, Minnesota's known uh, for them, water being just absolutely essential for life. Um, and as we grow, we need to manage that, uh, our, manage our growth and manage our water usage. Uh, my concern is for those communities that are in a vice, where they're mandated by one state agency to grow, however, there's no coordination with the DNR for adequate water resources to do that growth. Um, so as I take a look at Section 7, 511, 5.11, negligence on part of the state, um, when, say, for instance, uh, the Metropolitan Council mandates growth of a community but does not coordinate with the DNR for that resource of water, will Bill 1873 uh, address that, or do we need to have an amendment in here uh, in order that we don't bind our communities in their growth aspect when it's one part of the government telling another part um, to uh, adequately uh, resource that mandate. And I don't know if you have an answer for that, but uh, I would like to pose that question. Director Smith. Uh, Madam Chair, Representative, um, we coordinate with relevant state agencies and other partners by, like the Met Council when um, issuing water permits, um, primarily for the intent of this particular suite of tools is to address noncompliance. Um, and, and compliance is always the goal when encountering violations, so that's in the best interest of all parties involved. Um, so that education and collaboration and working with folks up front is really what we want to do and we're really reserving these penalty carrying tools for the most serious and egregious situations. So um, we'll continue to, to work with all the parties involved to try to resolve things up front before resorting to these tools. Right, follow up, Representative Weens. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. And thank you for that answer, Ms. Smith. I think the DNR has been uh, um, restrained in dealing with one of my communities that finds itself uh, over pumping to maintain the growth that it's mandated to do. Uh, I hope we can continue this discussion, whether it's in this bill uh, or another bill, that uh, we make certain that uh, state government, in in the event of these things happening or prior to the, the event, that it has better coordination. Because uh, I think you know water is a tremendous resource that we need to preserve. So thank you, thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. All right, uh, Representative Finke. Thank you, Chair Becker Finn and uh, Representative Kozlowski. I just want to double back. Did I hear from the testifiers that 96% of um, irrigators are in compliance with the standards? Representative Kozlowski. Yes, that's correct. The majority of uh, permit holders uh, do not pull over their, their permit. Now, of course, we have non-permit holders as well to address, and this bill would give um, more tools to be able to manage and, and bring those in as well. Representative Finke. Oh, that's all. All right. Uh, closing comments, Representative Kozlowski. Yep. Thank you, Chair Becker, and members of the committee for the conversation and um, discussion on this bill. Uh, we definitely are committed to following up on the questions. We will um, check back in on the venue as somebody from greater Minnesota, um, certainly understand the challenges that come. Um, so we'll, we'll be circling back with all of you and then continue to continue to work with, you know, the irrigators, the cities, the counties who um, are really the folks that we need to be able to address and get this bill um, to a strength in place. And for that reason, I would ask for your support in moving this back to the environment. And we are committed to um, continuing to have those conversations and getting the bill into the shape that it needs to be. All right, I will renew my motion to recommend that House Bill 1873 be re-referred to the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Kozlowski. Representative Kraft, now that we've got the right version of the bill in front of us. <coughs> mm. 
Uh, I will move to recommend that House File 2269 be re referred to the Climate, Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Committee. Uh, Representative Kraft, uh, and please, uh, audience members, if you need to go out the door and come back in, don't walk in front of the testifiers <laughs> table, please. Uh, I will move uh, your bill. Uh, please tell us about your bill, Representative Kraft. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. I had so much fun here last time, I'm back. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, so uh, I just want to provide some global context to this. There was a report yesterday that came out from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and I would encourage anyone to read it. There's a nice summary that's provided on it. But it basically said that uh, we as global community have uh, really are running you know, the end of our string on taking effective action on climate change. Um, and that we really need to redouble our efforts. So uh, with that, um, this HF2269 is a really important bill and I'm happy to present it to you. 40% of Minnesota's greenhouse gas emissions come from buildings and almost half of that comes from commercial buildings. HF2269 focuses on existing commercial buildings. It's built on the concept that you can't reduce what you don't measure. It requires building owners of buildings greater than 50,000 square feet to measure their energy usage and share it publicly. It creates an energy star-like rating for buildings and then provides tools for building owners to market their ratings. Just having this benchmarking data on its own has been shown to reduce energy usage on average one to 3% per year. And as, if not more importantly, this provides a foundation for future programs to reduce energy usage. HF 2269 also builds on experience that several cities have with benchmarking programs. We know how to do this already. Um, we've had a lot of stakeholder engagement on the bill and in fact came to agreement on all remaining issues with utilities yesterday. I'll reference a letter that was provided by Minnesota Power. But given the timing, some of the final agreements are not reflected in the existing language. Relative to the data and penalty provisions under the jurisdiction of this committee, I want to summarize some key things. Um, we're making clear that the utilities that are subject to this are those that serve the Twin Cities metro area and serve any city with a population of 50,000 or more and those that are IOUs or munis. Um, Section 8, a lot of it on data, much of that is being removed because we are instead pointing to an existing Public Utilities Commission order on data aggregation standards that many of the covered utilities already use. And in the area of enforcement, we're delaying the start of any monetary penalty to 2026, which is best practice for benchmarking standards around the country. So with that, I'll open it up to any questions. All right, um, nobody signed up ahead of time. Are there any members of the public wishing to testify on this bill? All right, not seeing any, we'll move on to member discussion. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, Representative Kraft, I reached out to my, um, <clears throat> my utility, my local utility, it's a um, co-op, and asked them what their thoughts were on this bill, and they have, they have concerns. Um, first of all, they said that the bill creates yet another set of requirements um, for consumers and utilities, um, increasing um, administrative costs for both of those entities without any funding. And then um, they, they also said, you know, if you're trying to increase building efficiency, then let's have that conversation rather than just leaping to this. Um, they also said that they're very uncomfortable with the data provisions in this, where they're where they're putting what is currently private information into the public realm where people, um, businesses um, could be shamed for, for, um, for a lower score on this uh, data piece. And um, there's, uh, they're seeing this as an unfunded mandate and um, they said there are grant dollars associated with this bill and no clear direction on the use of the expenditures, the use or expenditures. So I'm just wondering what you might say in response to those concerns from our co-op. Representative Kraft. Madam Chair, Representative, thank you for those questions. A few points uh, that I would say, you said leaping to this. This is something we've been doing in, in cities for years. There are 
uh, thousands of buildings that are covered already by it. So we know how to do this. Uh, we've talked, spent a lot of time in working with the co-ops. They are exempted from this because they don't have some of the systems in place to do it. And even doing that, we think we can get 80, you know, 80 percent plus of the buildings around the state. So I don't think your co-op would have an issue because they are, will be exempted from it. Um, you comment about businesses should be shamed. I prefer to think of it as a race to the top, giving them tools to market themselves. But yeah, absolutely. If uh, if a building is, falls lower on the score, there should be social pressure on them to improve their energy efficiency. So it, part of the intent of this is to make things public, um, but hopefully in a way to encourage a race to the top. And in terms of an unfunded mandate, we do have funds in there for the utilities that need them, but we've narrowed the scope of this, so I believe there'll be less utilities that will need that. Follow-up, Representative um, Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And um, so if we set this precedent with um, making information like this public, um, will it just be a short matter of time until my home, the bill, what, how much energy I use in my home, will that also be made public eventually? This seems like a, a really slippery slope is my point. And um, you say it's not public shaming, it's a race to the top. I'm not sure that businesses would view it that way. And I look at this bill and I'm like, it's, it's sort of a blanket um, approach. You know, there are different ages of buildings out there. Um, and, and so, and different um, uses for buildings. So it's, I don't see how it's gonna be an apples to apples comparison, um, given the variety of, of buildings and uses. We used to own a multifamily um, rental property and we, it wasn't uncommon to drive by in January when the boilers were on um, for a bunch of windows to be opened. So how would, a, in this case, someone that owns a multifamily unit building that's 50,000 square feet or more, um, and they have to get the information from their tenants, um, how would they approach this when when um, they have several um, of their tenants with their windows open in the middle of winter. And I'll, I'll remind members that we're here for the enforcement uh, and the data requirements, and we will come back at 6.30 tonight if we don't get through the agenda okay. today. Representative Kraft. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, Representative. Uh, so the, there are exclusions in this to exclude certain types of buildings that don't make sense. For example, we, we made clear that the mining companies, their buildings don't because it's not what this thing is intended for. Um, in terms of, you also made a statement about buildings need to get info from their tenants. That's not how this works. Um, the information comes from the utility companies. So the, uh, in, in the prior committee where we talked extensively about the process that building owners go through, uh, a building owner testified that it took maybe a couple hours to get it, the process set up, um, and then on an ongoing basis, a half an hour or so um, per year. This is not an imposition on building owners to do this. And you know, given where we're at uh, and the foundation this provides, I think this is an excellent program. Right. Follow-up, Representative uh, Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I know you, you said, Representative Kraft, that this isn't new that many cities have been doing that. I think there's maybe two or three cities in our entire state that have been doing this. And um, for some reason, um, the majority party seems to be really attacking businesses and putting layer upon layer upon layer of regulation on them. And I just, pretty soon, well, it's already happening. They're leaving the state because they can't keep up. And these small businesses, they don't have the personnel to, to, to implement a program like this. And so, Madam Chair, that, those are my only comments. Just seems like this is just a piling on and something that's unnecessary. Very few states are doing this. Um, we don't need to be doing this. Representative Johnson. Chair Beckervin, uh, Representative Kraft. I understand what you're doing here. You're trying to force businesses into uh, getting as most uh, energy efficient as possible. I can tell you this, every business is doing that already. Uh, the 50,000 square foot building is not very big. It's uh, a quarter of a block by a quarter of a block. Now, if you have multiple stories, it's even smaller. 
Well, Representative Kraft, um, what, you talk about buildings in your presentation. Uh, what type of buildings are your, is this bill designed to go after? Is it commercial, industrial, residential, apartment complexes? Uh, what are you trying, which areas are you trying to get to? <coughs> And Representative Johnson, that's not really before us. Uh, I will let you answer because I know Representative Kraft knows the answer because he knows his bill. Uh, Representative Kraft. Um, Madam Chair, Representative Johnson, so it's commercial buildings and there's definitions in, in the bill and language of what it excludes and does not. Commercial buildings, not residential. Multifamily falls, uh, I think it's four stories or over fall under the definition of uh, commercial. All right, final follow up, Representative Johnson. What? Chair Beckerfin, Representative Kraft, the reason I asked that question is because we need to know who's going to be penalized under this bill if they don't follow through. I know business, uh, my family does have uh, involved in uh, family owned entertainment centers. They're well over 50,000 square feet. Every day we're looking for ways to reduce energy costs. We've uh, replaced most of our lighting where we can with LEDs. We re replace, use only the refrigeration we have to. In the summertime, we shut freezers down. If we don't, we won't be in business. And that's every business is doing that. <clears throat> Bringing this information into what's private information, making it public, is not going to help. It's going to chase businesses out. It and some of the information you have to provide is very set, can be very sensitive, but you're opening it up to the public. There's a word I want to use, but I won't use it right now, what this bill is. We're, Businesses and manufacturing companies are already dealing with brownouts before we pass the blackout bill. The, this is just going to make it worse. We're going to be chasing businesses away when we need employers. Without businesses, our Minnesota economy goes down the tank. I, I, this bill needs to be uh, voted down and shut down. It's just going to hurt. If businesses want to do that, they can. If you want to set up a program where it's optional, do it. But don't force this down people's throats. Thank you. Uh, closing comments, Representative Kraft. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, uh, committee members. Um, I just strongly disagree with the comments you just made. Uh, I'll also say that you raised something about sensitive data. There are, if you read the bill, there are provisions in it to exempt out uh, situations where there are very few um, occupants of a, of a, of a facility. Um, and it is effective. It has been shown to reduce energy usage one to three percent per year on average. And uh, in the committee where we talked about this, um, the building owners that were there testified very clearly that it is not a significant amount of effort. And I think it will attract folks here that want to be um, in a place that cares about these things and um, and uh, values uh, sustainability. So with that, I would ask for your support. All Madam right. Chair, I'd like a, to request a roll call, please. All right, roll call having been requested, I'll renew my motion that House Bill 2269 be referred to the Climate and Energy Finance and Policy Committee. The clerk will take the roll. <coughs> Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Vice Chair Frazier. Minority Lead Scott. No. Representative Carroll. Aye. Representative Curran. Aye. Representative Feist. Representative Finke. Aye. Representative Frederick. Aye. Representative Grossel. No. Representative Johnson. No. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Nissen. No. Representative Weens. No. Six ayes, five nays.
uh, with six ayes and five nays, uh, the motion prevails. Thank you, Representative Kraft. Thank you. Uh, next up, we're going to move to Representative Hassan's bill. Uh, I will move House File 2369 be referred back to the Labor and Industry Finance and Policy Committee. Um, do you have an amendment? Okay. And then I understand you do have a DE2 amendment uh, to get the bill in the shape you would like? Good morning, Madam Chair. Yes, I do. All right. I would move the DE2 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Uh, Representative Hassan, uh, please tell us about your bill as amended. All right. Uh, good morning, uh, Madam Chair and members. Um, Salam alaikum um, to all the drivers and uh, members of the community here. Um, House File 2369 established uh, protections for drivers in the digital app world, like Uber and Lyft. Imagine. <laughs> You, um, you work for an employer who doesn't provide for the equipment that you use to um, do your work. You have to buy the car, you have to pay for insurance, you have to pay uh, for gas, and you have to take the risks, all the risks. But that same employer who provides the only thing, in this, in this case, is an app, uh, gets 70% of the commission rates, 70%. I encourage you uh, to look at your Uber bill uh, next time, ask for a receipt, and ask your Uber driver or a Lyft driver, how much did you get paid? I recently took an Uber ride. Um, it was a busy time, it was from my home to the airport, it cost me about $50. And I asked the driver, how much do you get paid? To my surprise, they only got paid $11 out of the $50. These are predominantly PIPOC workers. These are predominantly immigrants. These are people who either have low, low skills or are, don't have um, language proficiency. These are people who are raising families. Today, you will hear from one member who has lost her husband, who was the only breadwinner. She was pregnant at the time. She has five children, and she gave birth. She was pregnant at the time. She gave birth to the sixth child and lost her husband. Did Uber came to the rescue and say that they're going to compensate that family? No. Did they even send a letter to say we're sorry for your loss? Absolutely not. While the digital world advances, uh, and technology, you know, keeps creating more, more apps um, to make our world, you know, easy to access. Um, it's also leaving people behind, and that's why we're here today. Uh, this bill had a full hearing in Labor Committee, for a whole hour hearing, uh, and today, if you look both sides, you see drivers who are here today this early because this is an important bill to them. Um, this bill, you know, creates simple protections. Minnesota has a history of having strong worker protections, and it's creating simple protection. And I believe, Madam Chair, if I'm correct, the only provision we're talking about is the, the right to sue in this committee, because this bill is going back to labor. Um, I have um, Mr. Cooper here with me, who's quickly going to uh, just give us uh, a glimpse of what that section is. And then if you will uh, indulge me, I have a member who has lost her um, husband who would want to testify. Okay. Uh, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Uh, my name is Stephen Cooper and I uh, legally, I'm a lawyer and I legally assist the drivers on, on their concerns, most particularly including this one. The provision that I think is in front of this committee is provision number eight. And provision number eight is a standard uh, right to sue when, in fact, the law has been violated. And basically what it sets out is if this law is violated, you have the right to take it to district court. It has a couple other provisions in it. And a couple other provisions are, one, that you're entitled to um, triple damages if the court feels it's appropriate. 
you're entitled to $1,000 per violation if the court feels it's appropriate, and you're entitled to an attorney. Uh, the reason for those provisions, and it's used in lots of similar laws, the Civil Rights Act, other laws like that, uh, is to allow the, don't forget, you don't have well-funded drivers, allow them the fact to bring something to court if, in fact, it is serious. Uh, the other, maybe I'd stop at that point and see if there's any questions actually about that provision. Unless I have a question, I won't speak to any of the other provisions. Yep, yeah, no, the, and as uh, Representative Hassan stated, it, yes, the reason that this bill is here is to address that civil action provision, so I think that'll be sufficient. If you have another um, testifier. We have another testifier. Yep. And I believe I'm the interpreter, so if I'm... If I, if I'm Yes, so I'm the interpreter. Okay. Uh, please introduce yourself for the committee and proceed with your testimony. My name is Gary Muhammad Abdi. As I have uh, testified before, uh, in the other, in the labor committee, uh, my husband used to work for Uber and left. He was, um, while he was on his way to pick up uh, um, a, a passenger, sorry, it's too, too early for me. While he was on his way to pick up a passenger, um, there was a car chase between police and um, some criminals, and somebody hit him. He got out of the car um, after his car was hit, but he was caught, uh, um, the bullets flying, um, and he was uh, pronounced dead on the scene. We didn't know um, on the time of his death. Um, it, it took a while for the police to let us know that he was dead. The only way we find out he was dead uh, was that one of his friends was on the line when he was picking up the last passenger. And he told him that this was his last pickup, he's going home. Um, and when the accident happened, um, he was on the, on the call. And then his phone was dead, and then that's how we know to look for his uh, body. My my husband died at 2 a.m., uh, but we didn't find out until the next day at noon, as uh, so we've been calling around trying to figure out what actually happened. No one has contacted us from Uber, um, and not even the police. Uh, we had to make some. We have to make some phone calls to figure out what happened, and then finally they called the mark and find out that he was dead. We called every hospital in Minneapolis um, trying to find out what happened. No one could tell us anything. My husband got no justice, um, and we didn't get any compensation, not even a letter from Uber to say, we're sorry about your loss. So um, I'm asking you guys to help us and families like us. 
Thank you for your time. All right, thank you for your testimony. Um, I do have two members of the public signed up. I have uh, Joel Carlson and then Andrew Carlson on deck. And Carlson number two, if you want to get down here and get ready, we're we're short on time today. I don't have time for y'all to move around the room. Uh, rep uh, let's see. Uh, please go ahead and introduce yourself for the committee. Good morning, Madam Chair and members. I'm Joel Carlson, and I represent Uber Technologies, a company that I've represented since 2012 when Uber first started operating in uh, Minnesota, and we um, uh, are hopeful that something can be resolved, although I have to tell you, um, in 90 seconds, I can't go through an 11-page DE amendment, and I do think there are more things here than just Section 8 on the civil um, cause of action, and we absolutely support remedies for people that have been aggrieved. This is like any other animal in the country or within statute. These are contract disputes between uh, independent contractors. Uh, you have a remedy here that is treble damages plus attorney's fees plus a thousand dollar penalty that is unlike any other section in law. And that is not like a human rights violation. Uh, and well, Madam Chairman, Section 8 is in the bill. I would also tell you that uh, Section 7 of the bill uh, defines a TNC as an employer under the Minnesota Human Rights Act. And so that brings into question how we address our employment relationship with the earners that work uh, for our company, which we value and cherish uh, very much. Um, section 5 deals with a new board and the data that we have to submit to this new board without a classification uh, reference. And so I think Section 5 deals with this committee as well. Uh, and then in Section 12, not only is there a civil remedy, uh, but Section 12 on page 11 uh, provides for a four-year look back. Well, I'll have to ask you to yep. wrap up. I, 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 I do determine the jurisdiction of the committee. Yep. There is a letter from Uber. You could have, Thank you can you. also present written testimony. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Carlson, please introduce yourself and proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and members of the House Judiciary Committee. My name is Andrew Carlson uh, with Larkin Hoffman testifying today on behalf of Lyft. Lyft supports a policy proposal that guarantees driver independence and flexibility combined with an earnings floor and basic protections, but it's important that we do so in an objective, data-driven way that doesn't sacrifice rider affordability or jeopardize earning opportunities for drivers. Lyft has supported legislation to this effect across the country, for example, in March of 2022, following collaboration with organized labor in Washington State. Lyft was proud to support HB 2076. This landmark legislation ensures new benefits for drivers, including an earnings floor, paid sick uh, time, and on-the-job injury insurance. In California, Lyft supported Proposition 22, which was overwhelmingly supported by drivers and voters from all political backgrounds. It protects drivers' independence and flexibility by providing them with historic new benefits, including a minimum earnings guarantee a contribution towards health care coverage and insurance for on the platform injuries. Lyft, however, opposes this bill because it will be detrimental to the industry, drivers, and riders. Today, 60% of Lyft rides in Minnesota start and end in low-income areas. However, this bill will turn rideshare into a luxury, only affordable to wealthy Minnesotans. Rideshare also uh, provides tens of thousands of people in Minnesota with an opportunity uh, Earnings opportunities, uh, Minnesota drivers in the third quarter of 2022 were earning an average of $35 per utilized hour with tips and bonuses included. This reflects a 6% increase year over year. Rather than passing a bill that will hurt drivers and riders, we welcome an opportunity to work together to create smart benefits that protect this uh, important transportation option and earnings opportunity combined with protecting the independence and flexibility that drivers in Minnesota's overwhelmingly support. This bill introduced in the middle of session without state. It was a very input, long final sentence, is not Mr. Carlson. A good starting point. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to testify today. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, moving on to member discussion. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Representative Hassan. And you, your your testifier presenter of the bill described this um, civil action provision as a standard provision. Um, 
I'm curious as to what other provisions, uh, what other civil actions we uh, give treble damages for. This is a pretty, uh, quite, quite a non-standard uh, civil action provision compared to a lot of other um, statutory uh, rights of action we have in Minnesota. Uh, for instance, for Mr. start, Cooper. Oh, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, I apologize. And I'm uh, sorry, we didn't have your, your title or anything ahead of time. So. Uh, my, my name is Stephen Cooper and I'm an attorney that's uh, assisting the drivers. Okay, go ahead. Uh, and I'm sorry for the misdirection. Uh, as far as the, that provision, the Minnesota Human Rights Act has exactly these provisions. And the re, it's also used in a number of other kinds of things like whistleblower, uh, attorney's fees are available. A, wi a wide number of, of actions are. They're typically actions that are brought by uh, ordinary folks who don't have a lot of financial capacity. This language shows up in lots of state and federal uh, statutes. The, the member is correct that it is not in all, and there are some that it is not in. Um, so. If that responds to the question. Uh, Representative Niska, follow up. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, Mr. Cooper, um, uh, where in the Minnesota Human Rights Act is the treble damages provision? I don't know Ms. the section. Mr. Cooper. I used to be the, I'm sorry. That, that, yeah, I'm Mr. Chair. Cooper. Yeah. I, I don't have the section number off my head. I was the Commissioner of Human Rights for four years, uh, so I'm very familiar with the act. But the numbers all changed uh, since I went. Uh, in the Minnesota Human Rights Act, it specifically gives damages beyond what's here. It has uh, misdemeanor penalties, it has uh, other kinds of damages that are not in here. But there's no question that both Title VII of the federal government and the Minnesota Human Rights Act both give treble damages. And after the meeting, I can give you the section number. Representative Niska. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Mr. Cooper, I, I also was struck by your description of the um, language as, as giving discretion to the district court judge to, uh, uh, to, um, to award treble damages or attorney's fees. And the, the statutory language actually, or the bill language in 9.5 uh, 9 says, a prevailing plaintiff is entitled to three times the damages suffered, period. <laughs> And then uh, 9.8 to 9.9 says a prevailing party, a, plain, a, a prevailing plaintiff is entitled to reasonable attorney's fees, costs, and expenses, period. W where is the discretion given to a district court judge um, to award something less than uh, treble damages and attorney's fees? Mr. Uh, Cooper. Madam Chair. Uh, if we're looking, if we're looking at the this particular version, uh, I'm seeing right now. But if we're looking at it, it says the court may award a thousand dollar penalty. Uh, it says. Injunctive relief may be sought. I'm sorry, uh, member. Could you tell me what line you were looking at? You said it, but I missed it. Uh, he's talking about line 9.5 in the DE2. Okay, thank you. Uh, in this particular uh, version, it says is entitled to. So you you are correct. I misstated that particular sentence. Representative Niska. Uh, th thank you, Madam Chair. And I just wanted to uh, also point the, the testifier to 9.8 and then 9.9. A uh, 9. Point I'm sorry, Madam Chair. Well, uh, Representative Niska, if you could clarify what exactly your yeah, question the, is right now, that would the, be helpful. Uh, 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 the, uh, the similar problem I was pointing to on, on the sentence running from 9.8 to 9.9 .9 as well, that the, the testifier had described the attorney's fees provision as something that was discretionary for the district court and the, the bill language we have before us um, has the same mandatory language on in that sentence 9.8 to 9.9 .9. yeah and i don't think we need a response to that that is the language in the bill uh any follow-up representative niska um no thank you thank you madam chair uh again if if our if the purpose of this bill is to tell uh certain companies not to do business in minnesota i think that's um i think that having a treble damages provision and mandatory attorney's fees provision is the right direction to go if we want to do something that's going to accommodate and, and create a better workplace for uh, those who are working with those companies, I think that this bill is the wrong direction. All right. Uh, Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And I'll just make some closing comments. I really don't have a question on this bill. 
but um, no Ooh. one is forcing anyone to sign up to be one of these drivers. Um, they, they know when they sign up that they're independent contractors. They know what is expected of them. And this, in my view, is a not so wily attempt to unionize a private company. And for that reason, Madam Chair, I'm gonna be voting no, and I would encourage my members to do the same. All right, uh, closing comments for Representative Hassan. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, someone, uh, one of the testifiers um, that are posting the bill said that Uber and Lyft drivers make $30. There's a new study that says Uber and Lyft drivers make $11 or less um, and have to purchase a car uh, and their car have to be really a brand new car or, or somewhat a new car, um, pay insurance, um, if something happens to them, pay damages. And um, there is a gentleman in the audience who uh, was attacked while he was driving. He's still wearing the shirt that, that um, has blood stains on it. And he was in the hospital for days. Uh, no one paid him uh, a cent. Um, these are people who are, um, you know, Bread, the sole breadwinners of their family. This bill is about, it's about justice, it's about uh, standing up against greed, and it's about protecting workers. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Chair Hassan. Uh, I will renew my motion to recommend that House File 2369, as amended, be re-referred to the Labor and Industry Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The motion prevails. Uh, Representative Hewitt. Representative Hewitt, stop visiting and get down here. <laughs> uh, and if the audience could be as quiet as possible while they're leaving, that would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Representative Hewitt, uh, I will move to recommend that House File 1750 be re-referred back to the State and Local Government and Finance, Government Finance and Policy Committee. Um, and then I will also move your A3 amendment, which I um, believe is technical in nature. Is that correct, Representative Hewitt? All right. Uh, all those in favor of the A3, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. The bill is now in the shape you would like. Representative Hewitt, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's great to be back in front of Judiciary again. I want to reach out to uh, lead uh, uh, Scott for emailing me for some concerns she had. Hopefully I address them. If not, I'm sure I'm going to hear about them. <coughs> uh, House File 1750 is an administration cleanup bill that makes recommendations to policy changes. Admin proposes it includes a series of good governance updates and streamlines their work and corrects obsolete statute. Their changes under the, under the judiciary, <laughs> judiciary and Judicial Committee include codifying the data challenge, uh, challenge appeal process uh, currently in rule and clarifying the ability of the commissioner to dismiss appeals that do not meet the requirements for appealing in specific situations. Today I have with me someone from the department, Mrs. Goldsmith. Did I say it right? <laughs> this is, I'm sorry, I'm not talking well today again. Um, to, uh, to go into a deeper dive on the bill. Madam Chair. Uh, Director Moxley Goldsmith, and we, d we don't necessarily need a deep dive on the entire bill, but if you could stick to that data provision, that would be really great. Please go ahead. Madam Chair, members, my name is Taya Moxley-Goldsmith. I'm the Director of the Data Practices Office at the Department of Administration. We are a statewide resource on data practices and open meeting law for members of the public and government. And I'm here to, just to talk about Section 1 of House File 1750, which relates to data challenges and data challenge appeals, which is in Section 13.04 of the Data Practices Act. So as amended, this language is the same language that this committee heard last year. Um, and the bill does a couple things. One is it moves existing requirements from the administrative rules into the uh, statute so that they're, it's clear for both data subjects and government entities. And that's around the notice of the right to appeal and the timing of the right to appeal. Of the appeal. Um, and then it adds language confirming that the commissioner has permissive authority to dismiss appeals 
without informal resolution or a contested case hearing in three limited circumstances um, that don't meet the threshold for appeals. Um, and so I can speak more about that or if you have questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Um, we solicited feedback from government stakeholders. We met with Min Koji, we talked to Mr. Neumeister, um, we talked with OAH and we incorporated their feedback into the language that's before you. All right, uh, any other members of the public wishing to testify on this bill? Uh, moving on to member discussion, uh, Representative Scott. <laughs> Not sure why you looked at me. Yeah. Um, I don't know. <laughs> um, no, thank you, Representative Hewitt, for bringing this and um, to the uh, commissioner. Um, yeah, this I I think this is a good bill. It's always good, in my opinion, if there's a rule to bring it into statute so that it's very clear to the public um, uh, what what's required of them, and in this case, what's required of them if they're bringing a challenge um, that. A the government has a piece of data on them that they are contesting, this is the process that they use and, and always transparency is the best uh, model in that. So I support the bill. All right. Uh, closing comments, Representative Hewitt. Madam Chair, thank you for hearing the bill and uh, we'll uh, we're sending it back to our committee, right? To, uh, yep, over to local, thank you, state and local gov. Uh, with that, I'll renew my motion to recommend that House File 1750, as amended, be re-referred to the State and Local Government Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion prevails. Uh, next up, we're going to do Representative Agbaje, House File 2788. I will move to recommend that House File 2788 be re-referred back to the Public Safety Finance and Policy Committee. Um, and then I understand you have an A2 amendment, Representative Agbaje, I will move the A2 amendment. Uh, if you could tell us about that amendment, please. Yes, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, the A2 amendment makes some technical and operative changes. Um, basically, the amendment reinstates the newspaper publication requirement that was in current law. Uh, it creates the ability for the commission to recommend that the board hear an application in addition to the commission's recommendation to grant or deny it. Um, and then states clearly that board members can attend commission meetings and hear testimony and discussion should they want to. And finally, the amendment adds rulemaking authority for the commission to fast track certain applications for consideration by the board when the commission has unanimous support from all impacted parties. All right, uh, Representative Scott. Th thank you, Madam Chair. I do have a question um, for this amendment. D would this amendment match up this language to what it currently is in the Senate? Representative Agbaje. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Scott. I have not recently looked at the Senate language, so I would have to double check and get back to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. All right, All right uh, any further discussion to the A2? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion prevails. The bill is now in the shape you would like. Uh, Representative Agbaje, please tell us about your bill. Uh, reminding folks that this bill is before us because of the records and subpoena section. Representative Agbaje, please proceed. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair and committee members. So I'll just briefly say this bill deals with the pardon process, um, which is an incredibly important executive function envisioned by the founders of this country and the state to recognize the importance of redemption and dignity for people who have turned their lives around and for whom justice requires another look at the far-reaching legal consequences of a criminal conviction. Um, so with that, I won't go much further into the modifications of the pardon process, but just for the committee's uh, purview, uh, the Clemency Review Commission structure created in this bill centers equity, access, and inclusion, and also expands the pardon process support services to ensure full, meaningful participation from all interested parties, including the victims. So for the sections under the jurisdiction of this committee, many of the same processes and requirements that exist for the board will now be required of the Clemency Review Commission. Mainly, uh, this bill maintains that the ability to access records and issue subpoena by the board, um, and that's extended to the commission, and it preserves the requirement to file a copy of any granted pardons with the court of jurisdiction, um, which is still a part of current law. It also maintains access to pardon records in both judicial proceedings and for peace offer officer applications. It also provides open meeting law provisions for the newly created clemency review and maintaining them for the board. It also preserves requirements to provide notice and opportunity to provide input from the judges and prosecutors involved in the underlying criminal conviction. 
Additionally, the bill creates new protections and processes for both board and commission proceedings by articulating the circumstances where closed meetings and victim confidentiality can be provided should a victim choose to provide a statement related to the pardon application and also requires language access services for applicants and victims. This bill is supported by several stakeholders, particularly victim coalitions and national clemency experts. There's also a uh, fiscal note uh, for 986,000 for each fiscal year, um, which you'll see it as it's part of the inclusion in the governor's proposed budget for corrections. Um, and today I have two testifiers with me and I'll start with uh, national clemency expert, Professor Mark Osler. All right, Professor, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name's Mark Osler. I'm a professor of law at the University of St. Thomas. I'm a former federal prosecutor, and I've been training future prosecutors and defense attorneys for the last 22 years here and at Baylor University. When I moved to Minnesota in 2010, it was in part because I was given the opportunity to open a clemency clinic, and a lot of my study and work in this field has been in partnership with my students. One of the things that I did several years ago was begin to attend the pardon hearings. And what I saw was a system that was very dramatic, but also had some problems, um, many of which deal with the subject matter of this committee. Um, the, the specific changes I'd like to highlight, just in brief, one is shifting from uh, the Department of Corrections to a new commission, data analysis and collection is going to be significant because we're going to have people who that's their job who specialize in that and it's going to enhance the ability to build up data so that that can be used in making future decisions also this adds a subpoena power for that new commission people wonder well why would they need that well one reason would be to verify claims made by petitioners and that's something that we see sometimes in pardon hearings now is, is needing to happen in terms of participation by judges and prosecutors, this bill allows for that, uh, both at the commission level and at the pardon level, their voices will be heard as amended. That includes um, appearing in person at hearings. And finally, and importantly, this bill uh, enhances the participation of victims in the process. That not only do they have the ability and will be sought out uh, to give input into any decisions that are made. But for the first time, there's going to be a focus on victim services. In other words, they'll be given the support that they need as they come and make their presentation. Uh, and I thank you. Yep, and I wanna make sure we have time for your other testifier. Uh, so I believe we have uh, Mr. Tim Morin. Uh, if you can introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna to try to keep it together a little better than last time, so. <laughs> so, good morning, uh, Madam Beckenpin and my House of Legislators. My name is Tim Warren. Um, I come to you this morning to talk to you about the bill that is in front of us, <coughs> 2788. Um, I'm gonna shorten this up because last time it got a little long, but, uh, and do the best that I can. But before I do, I want everybody in this room to understand the kind of man that I am and the kind of man that people that this process is failing. Um, um, I am a firefighter, I'm an EMT, I'm a husband and a father. The kids get me every time. <laughs> I'm a business owner who's, and I supply jobs to the community. All right. I mentor troubled youth, I speak to youth groups where show me your me my messages, show me your future and I'll show you, uh, show me your friends and I'll show you your future and how small decisions can turn into large decisions. I have mentored troubled, uh, troubled youth. I have not been in any major trouble since my conviction. I haven't even had as much of a speeding ticket in the last 10 years. I was awarded the life, uh, Chisago County Life Saving Award. I have built homes for Habitat for Humanity. I have counseled individuals trying to find their place after serving time. I have served in soup kitchens. I'm a good Samaritan. A community, uh, excuse me, a good Samaritan of my, my communities. And lastly, I'm a man of faith. And again, I tell you this not to gloat, but to understand what kind of man this per or person this, this bill is, or their current process is failing. The, right now, because of the things that it's held me back from doing, it, it does not, uh, my prior conviction does not allow me from 19 years ago to be able to foster children, which my wife and I would like to do someday. Um, coach my kids sports. 
or uh, mentor youth in a, in a uh, program due to my conviction. All right, so 19 years ago, I made a mistake. I was an 18-year-old kid. I, I, uh, I ran with a group of troubled youth and uh, made some decisions that would not only affect me, but many others. Um, I don't discredit what happened that night. Um, and I, I've lived with it since. And a pardon will not, a pardon will, or any other decisions will ever change the way this permanently affect me. Uh, 14 years ago, I decided, I'm gonna cut some of this out, but uh, 14 years ago, I decided that I was going to, to uh, try to attempt to, to, to get a pardon. Um, I began the process. This process is long and grueling. It brought back a lot of hurt and question if I was worthy. After submitting my entire records, BCA records, background records, all with the respective stamps and uh, from the respective, respective departments, I also provided details case as to what I've been up to, what I plan to do with my pardon, and what I've been, uh, why I deserve it. This all sounds easy, but it is much more involved than just that. Once I submitted, I had to wait. I finally received the acceptance letter from the Board of Pardons. On the day, I remember feeling very nervous, I have more nervous than I have in a long time. I stood in the lobby waiting for the proceedings to begin. When it became my turn, I choked out what I had tried to draft, make it somewhat audible. My pastor spoke on my behalf, as did my business partner. Once that was all done, the board members asked their respective questions, and most of them about my case and my driving record when I was younger. Since being released, I, or driving record since being released, I answered the questions and everyone seemed to be happy with the answers. The vote came up and it became a vote of two to three. The one board member spoke up and said, I do not support this floor pardon. And uh, like that, the gravel was dropped and I was gone. I made it my way out of the courtroom and the victim's family hugged me and said, I'm sorry, did not work out. They showed up to support me. I remember feeling many feelings that day, but one that stood out the most was the feeling that if I got two out of three to support me and the victim's family not only support me, but took the time to show up and speak on my behalf, then shouldn't that hoard more weight than somebody, than one person's vote? This process is difficult and I do not feel that many deserve it. But those who prove they deserve it through years of action that support it should have something to strive for. Thank you for your time. Yeah, thank you for your testimony. Um, are there any other members of the public wishing to testify? Right, we'll move on to member discussion. Uh, Representative Chair Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I just wanted to thank you um, for bringing this bill and to your testifiers and just point out that there is another um, letter that didn't make it in time for your packets, but it's from a city council member from one of the cities I represent um, who actually was able to receive a pardon, uh, but in support of um, what your bill is trying to do here today. So just wanted to make sure that it's posted online so that people have a chance to look at that too. Thank you. All right, thank you. Representative Scott. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm just wondering, I know this is going back to public safety. I think a lot of times when people see Chapter 13, they think it's all to this committee, but it does address Chapter 13D, which is the open meeting law, and that is not the purview of our committee, that is state gov. And so um, I just want the record to reflect that this bill should go to state gov for those open meeting re reasons. So um, hopefully that will be the next motion um, from the Public Safety Committee <coughs> Is, is to go um, before the state gov uh, committee. Thank you. Uh, my understanding is that the chair of state gov waived. <coughs> okay. Um, so the motion before us uh, is to back to public safety. Closing comments, Representative Vic Badgey. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, committee members. Um, you know, the pardon process is really important. We need to make sure that we're giving opportunities for people to seek redemption. Um, and I look forward to your support as we send this back to public safety. All right. Uh, I will renew my motion to recommend that House Bill 2788 as amended be re referred to the Public Safety Finance and Policy Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The motion prevails. <coughs> Um, I'm just going to keep the gavel so we can keep moving. So um, I will move a House File 1580 uh, in front of the committee, uh, 1580 as amended before the committee. Uh, members, this was the bill on uh, law clerk pay that we fully took testimony on previously. Um, we laid it over, but now we've got to do a little procedural stuff to get it in the right shape. So uh, I will move to reconsider adoption of the DE1 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? 
the motion prevails. Uh, and then uh, I will withdraw the DE1 amendment. And now we're going to move to the DE2 amendment. Uh, so the DE2 members, uh, if you remember when we took testimony from the law clerks previously uh, and the district judges association, we didn't quite have the right numbers. Um, this DE2 amendment has the updated numbers now that we know how much it would cost. Uh, and this would raise the starting salary uh, for all law clerks uh, to 69,000. I don't have the number right in front of me. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, too many papers. Uh, and then uh, I also am, this also would. Uh, raise the uh, jury pay is currently $20. I don't know if folks realize that it's $20 a day uh, to serve on a jury. And uh, as members know, some juries uh, have to do that for a long time. So um, the other thing we're doing here is raising jury pay to $50 from $20. So that is the DE2 amendment. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the motion prevails on that. And then uh, we do have a couple testi testifiers, uh, uh, Mary Moriarty and then uh, Ed Reynoso on deck. <coughs> uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. My name is Mary Moriarty and I'm the Hennepin County Attorney. Thank you, uh, Chair Becker Finn, for allowing me to testify on behalf of the uh, raising the jury compensation bill. I did submit a letter, I'm not gonna repeat that. I'm gonna talk to you with my time today as a trial lawyer uh, who interviewed hundreds of jurors over my time. And I can tell you that jurors will say it never comes at a good time in anybody's life. But once they come, they typically want to serve. And if they do get to serve, it makes them feel very connected to the community that they're doing their public service. This is a bill that goes across the state. Um, in, because imagine, all of you know somebody who uh, is employed, self-employed or works at a job where they cannot get time off. And as Chair Becker Finn said, the pay right now is $20 a day. That just makes it impossible for many in our community to serve on our juries. That makes it impossible for us to get the diversity on our jurors, including different class, race, um, that sort of thing. That is one of the reasons why this bill is so incredibly important. We have jurors, I've heard jurors agonize over being asked, will you serve on this case? And saying, I want to serve on this case, but I don't have childcare. I can't be away from my job. I'm missing out on money that will allow me to pay my next mortgage. This will take a step in remedying that, and that is one of the reasons why it's critically important. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. Reynoso, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Edward Reynoso. I'm the Political and Legislative Affairs Director for Teamsters Local 320. I'm gonna be very brief, uh, only because I know there's, there's a few more bills to go. We solidly support this. We represent roughly 270 law clerks that this would impact, and so we're in full support. Thank you. All right, thank you for your testimony. Uh, is, we already took full public testimony uh, on this bill previously, uh, so with that, we'll move on to member discussion. Representative Niska. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I, as I expressed in the earlier um, hearing, I, I agree with the goal of this bill um, and the concern about um, especially law clerk salaries and how competitive it is. My concern isn't so much about what we're doing in this bill as um, I'm wondering about the precedent that exists and the precedent we might be setting by dictating within the judicial branch how they can spend particular pieces of money. So are there other places where the legislature in the past has kind of told the judicial branch we're gonna, you have to pay this type of worker this amount of money? Um, are, is the jury fee or jury payment, is that something that's set by the legislative branch or are we are we kind of doing something a little bit new in terms of saying this you have to pay jurors fifty dollars a day and you have to pay these particular <laughs> employees the certain salary um I'm not sure 
Ben's over there today. Um, <laughs> Mr. Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, Representatives, Ben Johnson with House Research. Uh, the short answer is that this is not a statutory requirement on the courts. If this is money to the courts. If they accept this money, it is under the uh, agreement that they will use the money for these stated purposes. If the courts elected to reject this money and said there was a separation of powers issue, there would be nothing that would require them to then pay the jurors $50 or pay their law clerks this amount. However, if they accept this money, it, it's got conditions attached to the money as a rider in the bill, and they would agree that they would use the money for that purpose. I mean, it, it is the job of the legislature to decide uh, how we spend uh, our, our state budget. Uh, Follow-up, Representative Niska. Yes, th thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate that point, and I appreciate the the the. Uh, the uh, that characterization. My, uh, um, I guess my question, my next, or the, the question that I don't think I um, fully understand yet is, uh, what has been our past, or our, our practice in the past in terms of creating riders like this on uh, judicial appropriations? I, and again, I, my concern isn't with this particular rider, it's you know what the legislature five years from now or 10 years from now might take this precedent of putting riders on our judicial appropriations and, and do it. So I'm curious as just a Well, and I, I think, I mean, we can, I, since it's not relevant to this particular bill, I think we could get that answer later. I think that probably, <laughs> I don't think uh, Mr. Johnson came prepared with that research question. Um, sure. So we can ask him to follow up. I do know that like we have allocated dollars for uh, interpreter pay. Um, that's something that we've done in the past, uh, you know, or is it, we've directed that that's where it be spent. Um, any further discussion to this bill? All right, uh, we'll renew my motion. Well, actually, there's no motion because I'm gonna. We're gonna just lay this over, and I, I bet we'll talk about this more when um, we talk more about numbers sometime soon. Uh, so with that, uh, I will lay over 1580 as amended. Uh, Representative Fraser. We, we did get permission to go a little bit over, so hopefully we don't have to come back uh, tonight. Uh, Vice Chair Frazier, would you like to move to recommend that uh, House File 2611 be placed on the general register? <laughs> yes, Madam Chair, that is my motion. All right, uh, please tell us about your bill. Madam Chair, House File 2611 is, is pretty straightforward. It would be an expansion of the current public defense board that was put in place back in the 1980s. The, the idea of this expansion is to add more public voice, um, essentially representing the individuals that are represented by our public defenders, and also requiring that at least one of the members would be someone who has practiced actually in a public as a public defender within the last five years. And I do have testifiers here to testify to the importance of, of the expansion and also the importance of having someone that has recently practiced as a public defender. Um, for obvious reasons, it's important to have um, good representation on this board. Um, and, and I would say the board is called the Board of Public Defense. It is important to have uh, more representation from the actual public that is, is being served. And I'll, I'll stand there and let the testifiers come and testify. All right, I've got Chris Lynch and Eliza Darris, if you both want to come up. And Chris, I have you listed first, but I, wh whoever wants to go first is fine. <laughs> uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. Good morning, my name is Eliza Darris. I'm a former member of the State Board of Public Defense. Good morning, Madam Chair and distinguished members of the committee. I come in support of House File 21, 20, excuse me, 2611. I was appointed by Governor Walls to the State Board in 2020 in replacement of a retiring board member, and I completed his term in January of this year. I am likely the first ever incarcerated, formerly incarcerated member of the board uh, who utilized the services of a public defender. Currently, I serve as board chair for All Square's Legal Revolution. I am also a board member of the Minnesota Black Chamber of Commerce and recently stepped down from Appetite Changes Board of Directors after serving uh, nearly five years. Based on my two years of experience with the board and its governance practices, I ardently urge this legislature to increase, to increase the board membership 
to better reflect the diversity of clients and personnel that this board represents and to allow the board to benefit from the professional experience of the type of Minnesotans who interact with uh, our clients um, most routinely. These professionals include social workers, chemical dependency counselors, and mental health professionals. The current board does not have anyone who has worked as a full-time public defender within the last few decades. The lack of temporal relationship and experience to current issues within the office typically made for discussions filled with hypotheticals or outdated examples from the late 80s or the early 90s. <coughs> to have a richer, better informed discussion, we needed board members better equipped to understand the nuances and caseloads of current public defenders in practice today. The lack of this perspective was very noticeable in our discussions. I urge this board to increase the size of and experience of the board to allow fresh ideas and different governance practices to flourish. Some of the current board members have served for more than two decades. That is an atypical governance practice. Increasing membership would help remedy these issues. Also needed on the board is members with professional financial acumen. This is critical because the primary duty of the board members is fiduciary in nature. One of the actions that I took when I joined uh, the board was to have the executive director of the board reconstitute the financial committee, which had not convened in more than five years. Board members with financial experience is critical towards protecting our system of public defense. Like many of you, I care deeply about our public defense system, and I urge you to diversify this board. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, please introduce yourself and go ahead with your testimony. Thank you. Oh. Yeah, I mean, it does work if the mic's a little bit closer. Thank you. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, my name is Christopher Lynch. I'm an assistant public defender and have been for about 20 years. My current assignment is in Anoka County in the 10th Judicial District. Um, and I've, I've been there for uh, many years now. Um, I think uh, Mr. Darris did a much better, uh, more eloquent job than I could of uh, addressing why this bill is important. But I would just say, you know, having worked in the court system for as long as I have, the perception certainly exists among a large number of our clients that when I am appointed to represent them, uh, I in some way either work for the prosecutor or work for the judges who are handling their case. Um, that's unfortunate because the independence of public defenders in the courtroom is absolutely critical to us being able to do our job. Um, the current constitution of the board um, allows the judicial branch to, to appoint a majority of the members of our board, which I think um, creates a problem, certainly uh, if not with the reality of the way the board functions, um, certainly with the perception of it. Um, so I support the current bill. Um, I certainly think it's beneficial to the board to have someone on the board who has experience working in public defense. I also think um, that the bill will allow the governor to appoint more members of the board who are members of the public, um, who look more like the clients that we serve, um, who are the clients that we serve, um, like Mr. Darris. I think that will create not only the reality, but also the perception um, that not only are individual public defenders, my ethical responsibility always in the courtroom um, is to no one but my client. Um, and uh, this bill helps to align the reality of our governance structure um, and help to create the perception um, that in fact, public defenders, not only individual public defenders, but the system of public defense works for the people of Minnesota and that public defense works for the people that we represent. Thank you for your time. Thank you. And then we do have a couple other members of the public signed up. Uh, Kevin Kyer, uh, Molly Janetta, and Daniel Lee. Thank you for your testimony. Feel free to use some of these other chairs if you'd like as well. Uh, please introduce yourself and go ahead. Madam Chair and members, Kevin Kyer, Chief Administrator for the Board of Public Defense. Uh, Madam Chair and members, the board does have a long-standing policy supporting the existing law governing the board. This policy was born out of a tremendous upheaval in the 1980s and 1990s. During that time, there were three different service delivery models of public defense. You had counties, 
who were providing service through part-time public defenders and contractors. You had a judicial council who oversaw, it was a panel of judges who oversaw district-wide public defense that was paid for by the counties. And then you also had two full service districts uh, in Hennepin and Ramsey County. Uh, with the move to state funding and state assumption of court costs and public defender costs, there was a need to transition to an independent board. Um, the Board of Public Defense was created to replace the Judicial Council. There were numerous political fights, there were lawsuits, uh, there were legislative changes that went into this. There were an average of double digit changes to the, each enabling statute over the course of the 1990s. The, at one time, the governor did have a majority of appointments to this board. Um, there were several issues that were raised because of that. The first one was a constitutional one. The court was very concerned about having the governor appoint a majority of board members to a judicial branch agency. Secondly, there was a concern of partisanship. And lastly, the concern of keeping the board independent. Um, the current structure, which has served this state well, was a compromise among the legislature, the judiciary, and the executive branch to ensure not only the board's independence, but that uh, nonpartisanship. I think that was a, a model that was well served and has well served. I think it's evidenced by the fact that you all just passed a funding bill unanimously on the House floor. Uh, Madam Chair, with that, I would turn it over to our uh, other testifiers. All right. Uh, please introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Molly Janetta. I am the current chair of the Board of Public Defense. The board is made up of seven members, uh, four of which are attorneys who are appointed by the Supreme Court, and three of which are public members appointed by the governor. I'm one of the public members, and I am a retired human resource and labor <coughs> relations professional. <clears throat> Excuse me. I live in Duluth. Uh, the Public Defense Board is a policy board, uh, not an operations board, <clears throat> and Minnesota Statute 611-215 spells out the duties. <clears throat> One is to approve and recommend to the legislature a budget for the board, the state public defender, the judicial districts, and uh, the four public defense corporations. Number two, we establish procedures for the distribution of this funding to these entities. And we also appoint each judicial chief public defender as well as the state public defender. The statute also states that all members shall demonstrate an interest in maintaining a high quality independent defense system and also appointments to the board shall include women and members of minority groups and also that at least three of the members be from outstate Minnesota. Finally, Madam Chair, I just wanted to let the committee know that as part of our periodic planning process, our board is currently reviewing all of its enabling and governing statutes, most, most of which date back to the 90s. And we'd like to come back to the legislature next year with a comprehensive bill that updates its governance structure and improves its processes. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, please, please introduce yourself and proceed with your testimony. Good morning, Chairperson, Be Chairperson becker Fan. Members of the committee, my name is Daniel Lee. I am the general counsel of the Minnesota Credit Union Network. I've had the honor to serve on the State Board of Defense since 2016. I am presently the personnel committee chair. Uh, with regards to my journey to sitting before you here today, that started as a law clerk at the Ramsey County Public Defender's Office. And so I thank you for your work on that. I'm here to test testify upon the composition of the board in my experience and time on the board uh, as this body considers board expansion. Uh, I currently serve uh, as one of three persons of color on that board. Uh, my other two colleagues are African American males. I have the privilege to serve with three uh, outstanding women who are members of that board. Uh, four of our members are from outstate and represent outstate uh, communities in the first, second, fourth, and tenth district. Uh, with that, uh, 
there are three of us who I am currently a member of the criminal justice uh, panel uh, with the Federal Public Defender's Office and have been so for the last 13 years. Uh, two of our other attorneys appointed to the board have over 10 years experience providing public defender services. Uh, and additionally, our fourth attorney member is a retired state Supreme Court justice. With that, I will yield my time. All right, uh, moving on to member discussion. Repres uh, Chair Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to thank Representative Frazier for bringing this bill. And, um, you know, thank you for all the testifiers. I don't think this is any, you know, criticism of you personally and your dedication. Um, but I just wanted to note that, you know, the, the history was kind of laid out, and I appreciated that. But, um, you know, just because this was a compromise 30 or 40 years ago doesn't mean that it's serving the right purpose now and that it, it's not worth looking at now. So just wanted to make that um, comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair Muller. I always think it's funny people talk about the 90s like it was, <laughs> that was 30 years ago. Um, <laughs> Representative Johnson. Chair Becker, Finn, uh, Representative Fra Frazier. I do have concerns with this bill. Our public defenders and our judiciary system alone is a separate entity. Do we have the authority to do this? Absolutely. Is it the right thing to do? I don't think so. When it comes to justice, we need to make sure that we have the people there that know what, know what they're doing, high ethics, and not political hacks. <clears throat> Currently, there's seven members on this board, four appointed by the Chief Justice, three appointed by the Governor. The four, the four attorneys ap appointed by the uh, Chief Justice, they have to be well acquainted with defense of a person accused of a crime. People that know how to defend a person, how it should be defended, what they should do. They cannot be a prosecutor. So it's by keeping the prosecutors off this board it's making sure that people doing the defense of the individual is, in, is taking care of it and making sure they do things properly. One of, one, of, one of the members has to be a retired public defender. And then there's three people appointed by the governor. This bill takes this board to be an objective, looking at what's best for the individuals charged with a crime that's using a public defender system, to make it a partisan political board. By giving the executive branch power over it. It makes me concerned what's going on. This is happening in all the different boards dealing with public safety. Representative Johnson, you're, you're walking very close to the motives, so let's, uh, let's be I careful. I understand. If we could wrap up. This is what's happening. So I have concerns. I would ask members to vote against this uh, proposal. I think it will actually do more harm than good. Public safety is a huge issue. Justice needs to be done fairly amongst everybody. And I trust our judicial system to do that. I do not trust our political system to do that. Uh, this, this changes it from a, from a judicial system to a political system. And I think that's the wrong way to go. Uh, closing comments, Representative Vice Chair Frazier. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for the comments that were made. Representative Chair Moeller and Representative Johnson, I appreciate the perspective. What I will say is that this is, this is a public defense board, and what we're trying to do is add more of the public voice to the board. Um, that I have no intentions of creating any type of um, partisan board, but I do have the intentions of broadening the perspectives that serve on this board. 
And I think a great point was made earlier by one of the testifiers. It's not an operational board, it's the policy board. And I think you need voices that are closest to the issues that are happening to make fair and sound policy that is informed by lived experiences. I think that's very important. That's what this bill is about. Um, and we'll continue the conversation as we move on. So I would appreciate the member's support. All right, and just to move us move us along, uh, we'll uh, renew my motion that uh, we refer this to the general register. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. The motion prevails. Representative Greenman was sitting in the one spot where I could not see her. Uh, Representative Greenman, uh, are my motions? Uh, we'll move House File 635 be re-referred to Ways and Means. Uh, please tell us about your bill. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and in the interest of time, I left my testifiers, but I'm going to try to incorporate some of the reasons that we need the civil uh, provisions of this bill and have had uh, great bipartisan support in both the committees that we've heard before. Um, this is a bill about the 30,000 uh, of our friends and neighbors who in every election uh, pitch in to help prepare staff, um, uh, our election, uh, our polling places, send absentee ballots, and process the ballots and the results. For many, it's a small portion of the year, and for these, for some public servants, it's part of their job that they do for cities and counties year-round. These are private citizens doing the apolitical work, but unfortunately, in the last three years, the increasingly tense political environment, aggressive rhetoric, disinformation about our elections, and social media has involuntarily thrust these men and women um, into the spotlight. Um, and this is happening around the country and here in Minnesota. Disinformation about voting machines, an election quote unquote fraud, and an impossible or irresponsible and misplaced targeting of local public servants has all contributed to an increasing uh, fear and insecurity of those folks who administer our elections. In some cases, we've seen extreme examples of election workers and administrators face credible death threats and harassment. Um, and across the country, we have seen and heard about f fears uh, surrounding the impact uh, that these are having. Um, we have also seen efforts to tamper with and interfere with the infrastructure of our elections in Colorado, in Georgia, in Michigan. We saw deeply troubling and illegal efforts um, driven by the big lie of a stolen election. Um, in Minnesota, we have uh, not yet faced some of the same levels of intimidation that we've seen in Arizona and Wisconsin and Michigan and Colorado and Pennsylvania and Georgia, but we're not immune and we also should not be naive. Unfortunately, the problem is growing and the pattern is a national trend. I will just say that in elections committee, we heard from Michael Stahlberger, who's an elections administrator from Blue Earth County on behalf of MAKO and shared a survey they conducted with Minnesota County and elections officials. 57% said that they have been intimidated while performing their duties. 46% of the people who responded said that they added additional physical security to polling places and elections offices. 26% reported removing precinct election officials uh, for neglect, neglect of duty, misconduct, or tampering. They shared, on average, that they were worried about security and safety. Representative Greenman, we have two minutes. So well, if there's, <laughs> thank you. I'll just, I, I I can leave it at that. If you look at look at the bell, I didn't have testifiers because they know that we were in the issue yep. of time. Uh, are there any members of the public wishing to testify on this bill? All right, we'll move on to member discussion. Right, not seeing any. Uh, all those in favor, I will renew my motion to recommend that House File 635 be re-referred to the Ways and Means Committee. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. The motion prevails. Uh, with that, we are adjourned.